I think the last session talking about cultures and nuances, I think is very relevant to us in Bhutan, um, where today, I mean, as I stand here, uh, um, I've been trying to track the results of our elections. Four years ago when I was here, we had just done an election in 2008, but today is the um, primary rounds, which will de determine which of um, f four parties which will make it to the um, general elections in July. So the newspaper is actually tracking numbers as they come in. So every hour or so, I take out my laptop and check for that. OK, so sorry. Um, today, May 31st, everyone's very nervous because we have four political parties, all of them fielding candidates, and only two will make it to the final rounds. This is a picture of um, taken just a few days ago uh, in a place called Lunana. And uh, this is where the election polling team landed, together with the reporter, as they were trying to set up um, a polling station. Um, so today, in the last few weeks, we've never been more reliant on the press than we have you know, uh, from February this year, because it is only through the newspapers and on TV that people in Bhutan get an idea of who the candidates are, what the parties are about. Um, and they're very strict guidelines, they're given like 10 minutes, on uh, 10 minutes on radio, six minutes on TV each, and then you know, um, very strict election guidelines for candidates when they're doing their campaigns. So these are just the little bits of window that the average citizen has to understand who they're gonna be voting for. So um, the role of the press is very, very important. And um, we are actually a very old culture, but with a very short modern history, and therefore uh, the role of the press is so new in Bhutan. You know, until 1986, we didn't have a newspaper. So the first newspaper emerged in 1986. The radio started around that time. Today we have 12 newspapers. Um, obviously, media literacy is exceedingly low in a country where media is so new. But at the same time, I think, um, our challenges haven't changed very much from the time I last met Howie. We now have more global TV channels than ever. We, we get access to more than 190 channels, most of them from the region. So our youngsters and we ourselves grow up to you know, watching more of news from outside than from Bhutan. Because as you can see, the country is so diverse, it's very hard for the press to move out of the capital. Um, the role of media, you know, there's a quotation here that we picked up from. We did a youth forum a year ago and one of our MPs came and she said, the media is the third eye for decision makers. You know, the belief in the third eye is the wisdom eye, the enlightenment eye. So we, we picked that up. And media's role in Bhutan is very important, not just for information, but for education. And also, especially during elections, you know, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier. But today, I think, uh, we're very conscious that media's role as a storyteller, media's role as a docu documenter of history continues to be exceedingly important. And this is where, when you talk about nuances, about culture, I think what we're discovering in Bhutan is that uh, our newspapers are taking their role as a watchdog very, very seriously, and they've taken on a very Western-centric model uh, of investigating issues, uh, very harsh, very direct, you know, and they're very effective. But what it also means is that many people in Bhutan are not used to that kind of a model. Uh, so the older generation is a bit aghast. Oh, what kind of reporting is this? Look at the offensive words that creep in. They don't know what it is, but they don't feel comfortable. They feel there's something wrong with this reporting. How dare these 20 somethings question the integrity of people who have been working so hard for the nation for the last three decades or four or five. Um, but the young people really like this. I mean, they think, wow, this is it. You know, it's like being an investigator, you know, uh, um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, they're used to going on Facebook. They're used to very quick reactionary kind of messaging. Um, they like the fact that we have watchdogs. You know, they, they are for people who 
maybe are disadvantaged or, or they believe are marginalized, so they think this is the kind of language we want. So we actually now have a bit of a cultural diff transition, you know, and, and it's, a lot of it is modeled by the press. And with the lack of critical thinking, uh, that creeps in. There's a lot of belief in what the press provides, for, including among teachers, we've discovered, and uh, not just among teachers, even a lot of our college youth. I mean, we've just come back from a visit to four colleges across the country, and um, many of our youth, um, we realize, are very influenced by the press. They believe everything that's been written, so sometimes very quickly um, they jump to conclusion. So this is where fairness and bias, you know, that that little lesson comes in because they they make sweeping statements like, "Oh, corruption! People are all corrupt," you know, and the stereotyping of uh, people who go into politics, for example. You know, a lot of this imagery comes from news media outside the country. So I can even quote, there was um, a student last year who quoted, he said, look, he said, all our MPs, they're all out for themselves. So he said, how do you know that? So you can see it in the news. And what news? NDTV, which is an Indian channel. <laughs> you know, they quote, you see, unfortunately, sometimes we live in a neighborhood where democracy has had a lot of problems, and that's South Asia. And that's the kind of news we've been looking at all the time. And now when we ourselves are trying to tell our own democratic story, we, our minds are already colored by what we've been reading. So we jump to conclusions. And we were quite surprised when many young college students made these broad sweeping statements and a lot of assumptions. And we found that using some of the Stony Brook uh, sort of uh, lessons have really helped. You say, where's your evidence? How did you make that assumption? You know, what are the sources? And we realize now we can actually try and find ways to try and embed this a little deeper because it's so critical. Um, so, um, so I was talking about the press verging, you know, becoming very cynical. Even our reporters are becoming cynical. The way we're painting democracy tends to be a little negative. It's like, oh, all these people going to politics, they're there for their own gain, you know, et cetera, which is, Really, and we go around saying this, you really need to be less judgmental and find the evidence for it before we jump, jump to that conclusion. And we believe that, you know, democracy is just five years old. If you're all negative and cynical about it, what hope is there for us to make it work? So in Bhutan, we call democracy a gift from the king, from the monarch. And the sudden, you know, it was a great thing. The transition was, you know, without a coup, it was done almost seamlessly, but suddenly, five years later, we have a very cynical press, we have a growing group of young cynical people who think that democracy, while it's very good to shine a light on the injustice and the problems, I think it's also important that the press and people learn how to read the press so that we give it a chance. Right? Um, we call ourselves a work in progress. Our classrooms don't do enough to teach critical thinking. Uh, we've expanded so quickly with schools across the country. They're jam-packed. There's no time. Children are not given the time to raise a hand like Dean to ask questions. There's just no time. So we've grown up in a system where rote learning has been important. And even asking a question is a new culture, but an important one. So um, we've discovered that it's very hard to teach critical thinking. When we went to the education ministry, we said, we'd like to do this. They said, oh, keep away. We have so much to do. We've got to teach about this, about that. Everything is new in Bhutan. We have, we have no words for many things, from computers to IT to tweet, tweet you know, you name it. They, they, they were a little overwhelmed. They said, but you can pilot, you can test, you know, you can do it outside. So we believe, though, that maybe teaching is very diff difficult. We don't have that many. Um, so we, have, we don't have a course called critical thinking. It's not embedded into anything. So what we're doing is new. And it takes a lot of energy to try and persuade people that this is important. But we believe that when we, uh, I mean, we've tested it and we found that when we put in activities where you have, um, you know, uh, you go and explore things or journalism, teaching them to think like a journalist really helps. For the first time you see how Youth are empowered by the fact that, you mean I can ask a question of my headmaster? You know, uh, they get really empowered. Uh, after our last journalism workshop at the college, just a month ago, a week later, 
the member of par I mean, the candidate for the East, who happens to be the previous prime minister, turned up. And then the club decided to uh, stay on and ask for a news conference, and he obliged. And they were so thrilled that they had a one-to-one, -one, they, as a group, as a media club group, they were able to have a conversation with an aspiring candidate and, and ask questions. So they mailed us and they said, this is such a great experience. We're so glad we, we, went, you know, we learned how to ask some questions at least you know, before. So this interaction, this interface is possible in Bhutan because we're a small country. But this is where we see youngsters' eyes light up and say, wow, it's not easy to be a reporter, but now I, now I understand why it's so difficult to say things and put it on record and put it in print. Can I be responsible for it? You know? So learning through, through action, uh, is important. Um, in an Asian context, learning to overcome the cynicism is important. You know, just, just because um, I think uh, for us, we're, we sometimes call, kid ourselves by saying we're almost like a new country, we're just starting up. You know, we don't want to be already jaded when we're just at the beginning of the journey. Or, you know, it's important for us to have some hope. And unfortunately, this Western style watchdog journalism, while it's important, we're not sure we can import it fully. So how do we contextualize it, right? So in our classes, sometimes we also talk about the need to be compassionate, to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. Like I think some of you do do that as well. And um, we also try to say that it's not alien to our culture because Bhutan is a largely Buddhist society. And Buddha has always taught that we should never believe everything. We have to question, question, question. So we use that, you know, and that was, that's a very comfortable way f for us to get in, to say that asking a question is not being disrespectful. Asking a question should not lead to greater conflict. You have to search for facts, try and get as close to the truth as possible. But it doesn't mean that, you know, um, you know, when you create this negative story, it feeds on your own ego, and then you feel like, wow, you know, I'm, you know, I've done something. Um, that that we think uh, in Bhutan's context um, is not going to be uh, not useful at this moment. Because what it means is this result of people climbing down, climbing up, not wanting to talk to the press, right? And then the press has got such a, you know, a growing, uh, is facing a growing sort of resistance by people in society. All, all they do is look for the negative, and they want to be sensational, and just avoid it. Right? And then the readers and the audience, the young, us, when we read it, it's all negative. So, We've been talking to the press and trying to persuade them that, hey, maybe we should find that balance and give us some hope. You know, if you look back in history, 50 years from now, and, and our youngsters all do research, the, the biggest recorder of contemporary history is the press, is journalism. What we can find is like the darkest days of this history, when in fact it's not. So much is happening. Everyone is sincerely trying to do a great job. So these are some of the challenges and the cultural differences that we find in the world. So I'm going to jump straight to what we've been doing. Um, we've been supporting, you know, so we've not gotten into the curriculum, but what we've done is we've, we've supported media clubs. We support 10 clubs, four in colleges and the rest in high school. And in the clubs, we try to begin by um, sharing with them the five, four or five four lessons for the school model. Power of information, fairness, bias, why you need to verify information, sources, just that. Then we bring them over in winter and summer, and we run what we call the Media Nomads Workshop. And in this workshop, we do things like podcasting, journalism, and then we again try to embed these lessons there informally. And then we find that by through practice, the youngsters get very inspired. Um, so far, um, two, two of our clubs have started going out to very rural areas in Bhutan to share what they've learned. You know, and um, they've, had, they've been so empowered by that. The first cohort is graduating, and they've asked us if they can come and volunteer with us. You know, until they get a job and they want to go out to more schools. But we are concerned about the, the quality of the performance. We've tried to walk them through it, the presentations, but we've not had time to assess 
We've not been there with them. So we'd like to take this on, but we think it's, it's uh, one way of reaching out peer to peer. The whole notion of a media nomad is I learn something, I will go and talk to at least one person in my community, being a nomad and sharing it that way. So that, I think, works. Um, we, of course, BCMD also hosts forums and seminars on democracy, on the role of media, but this separately for, for others, for working people. Uh, we've tried with Sony Brook's assistance, with Dean and Michael, we've done two workshops with teachers. Because we realized that to get the youngsters, we also need to introduce this whole concept to teachers. Uh, teachers, we realize, are pretty skeptical. They're a bit worried. You know, they think we're politicizing their youth, number one. <laughs> then they think that, you know, um, you're teaching them to be critical. You know, you're teaching them to be, you know, critics. What are you doing? So, you know, we realize critical thinking, we need to reach the teachers as well. So we've tried to make an effort to do that. Um, and, um, most recently, we have partnered with um, uh, the Royal Education Council. The council tries to implement new ways of improving education. So they've actually told us to try and um, design some activities that their schools can use. So some of these lesson plans that we have devised together, tried to contextualize together, is um, uh, we're, we're offering to the ed council schools. These are pilot schools, and we need to follow up with them. This is very new. But what we do know is that the model that has been um, uh, designed here at Stony Brook is an American model, and we're very conscious in an Asian context that some of them look at it and they don't get it, you know, the examples. So I know that one of our shortcomings is we've not placed enough emphasis on designing. We've not had the time or the ability till now to really contextualize it. We're trying very hard. We're now taping stuff off the television to supplement the stuff we've done. Uh, we're tr trying to send people out. We have to now get professionals. We were just banking on everyone providing pictures, but we need good pictures, so we're, we're spending time doing that. So I think that that is, um, that is about it. <laughs>